Iconoclasm spans a period of Byzantine history between 730 and 843. Over these 113 years, with a brief pause between 787 and 815, the rich artistic tradition of the Eastern Roman Empire, spanning more than four centuries, endured significant losses. This entailed the imperial decree prohibiting the production of religious images and the active destruction of existing artworks. Rooted in the political and religious elites of Constantinople, this movement left a lasting impact on the medieval world. Often termed a dark age for Byzantine art, iconoclasm profoundly influenced not only the future of the empire's art, but also medieval Europe as a whole. Before going further, if you are interested in art history content that is a little more obscure, we will be putting out more videos soon, so make sure to subscribe. Thank you for watching. In the years 726 and 727, a massive volcanic eruption struck the islands of Thera and Therasia in the Aegean Sea. Byzantine Emperor Leo III interpreted this natural disaster as divine wrath, to be appeased only by banning the veneration of icons. Leo III, born in Germanicaea, where the iconoclast tradition of monophysitism was prevalent, had already shown his intent to pursue this path. Between 727 and 730, he issued a series of edicts officially initiating the iconoclasm period. This transgression against the Church of Constantinople led to the replacement of Patriarch Germanos with the iconoclast Anastasios. Although Leo III ignited the iconoclastic fervor, it reached its zenith during his son Constantine V's rule. Constantine authored 13 theological treatises on iconoclasm and, in the surviving two, rejected the possibility of depicting the divine nature of Christ. In 754, he convened the Iconoclastic Council in Hyria, officially denouncing icons as idols, ordering their destruction, and anathematizing all iconodules. Constantine V also persecuted his religious and political adversaries, primarily abbots and monks, who held equally fervent convictions. Iconodules in Constantinople rallied around Stephen the Younger, who was killed by a mob in 765. A brief respite occurred between 787 and 815, thanks to a series of Orthodox emperors, beginning with Empress Irene. Irene convened an iconophile council in Nicaea in 787, later recognized as the Seventh Ecumenical Council, overturning the decisions of the Council of Hyria. The council drew inspiration mainly from the writings of John of Damascus, an earlier opponent of iconoclasm. Although Leo V returned the church to iconoclasm in 815, the movement lacked the vigor and significance it held in the 8th century. In the same year, Leo V summoned the Second Council of Iconoclasts, overturning the decisions of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, anathematizing its participants, and re-legitimizing the Council of Hieria. The rule of Leo V, Michael II, and Theophilos characterized the second wave of iconoclasm. Michael's contribution to iconoclasm involved banning discussions on icons, and Theophilos renewed persecutions of iconophiles. After Emperor Theophilus passed away in 842, his wife Theodora and the new patriarch Methodius organized a council in Constantinople that reaffirmed the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The conclusion of the council was marked by a grand procession through the city, celebrating the victory over the iconoclast heresy. Besides Leo III's interpretation of natural disasters as signs of God's anger, there were various theological and philosophical arguments supporting the destruction of icons. Perhaps the most significant argument derived from the Old Testament and one of God's Ten Commandments, You shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not adore them nor serve them. Another argument arose from Neoplatonist teachings as propagated by the philosopher Plotinus. Neoplatonists viewed the material world not as inherently evil, but rather as a mere image or reflection of a higher ideal world. According to this perspective, humans should strive toward the archetype of these images and worship should be directed solely at that archetype, not its earthly representation. Additionally, the writings of Eusebius of Caesarea, a 4th century historian and theologian, argued that the divine nature of Christ was beyond human comprehension.
While Leo III's iconoclasm was primarily rooted in religious reasons, some historians have suggested that the emperor aimed to curb the growing political power and wealth of monasteries by prohibiting icons. Another, though less likely, hypothesis suggests that Leo sought to integrate Muslim and Jewish populations, both of which viewed Christian images as idols. The iconoclasm period saw a stagnation in the creation of images, which were central to Byzantine art. However, since iconoclasm was a movement largely associated with the politics of the capital and often rejected in other parts of the empire, few surviving examples exist today. One notable example of Byzantine iconoclasm is the cross in the apse of Hagia Irene, a significant church in Constantinople. The church had been severely damaged by an earthquake in 740 and was likely reconstructed during the reign of the iconoclastic emperor Constantine V, during which the cross was added. The motif of the cross was one of the rare symbols permitted by the state during this period. Mosaics featuring plain crosses can also be found in other churches in Constantinople, including the Hagia Sophia. Above the imperial door in the Hagia Sophia, two lunettes with crosses remain unusually intact, having not been replaced or destroyed over the centuries. One of the most prolific defenders of the veneration of icons was John of Damascus. He strongly opposed iconoclasm as well as Islamic prohibitions against images. His significant work, Three Treatises on the Divine Images, delineated the distinction between correct and incorrect worship and aimed to define the nature of images. John's argument centered on the belief that Christ and humanity were both images of God, material manifestations of a spiritual ideal. The Patriarchate of Constantinople canonized John of Damascus for his defense of icons. He developed an entire theology of icons, viewing them as symbols in the Neoplatonist sense and connecting the image of Christ with his incarnation. Another fervent champion of icons was Theodore the Studite, the abbot of the Studios Monastery in Constantinople. Between 787 and 815, his epigrams celebrating icons were displayed at the chalky gate of the imperial palace. Theodore played a leading role in the iconodule opposition during the second iconoclasm period. Although he changed his stance on icons in a few instances, Theodore composed a polemical treatise, the Refutatio, in which he countered the arguments and merits of the new iconoclasts. The significance of the iconoclastic controversy and its immediate influences are evident in a surviving 9th century manuscript, the Kludov Psalter, created in the middle of the 9th century as orthodoxy prevailed over iconoclasm. This Psalter includes a section discussing the controversy, accompanied by illustrations on its pages. One page depicts the crucifixion scene, specifically the moment when Roman soldiers offer vinegar on a sponge to Christ, corresponding to Psalm 69. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. In the foreground of this illustration stands the portrait of the last iconoclast patriarch of Constantinople, John Grammaticos. He is deliberately caricatured with unruly hair as he attempts to erase the image of Christ using the same pole and sponge seen in the crucifixion scene. The restoration of the veneration of icons marked the beginning of a new decorative program for churches based on a revised theology of images. Around 867, the Hagia Sophia introduced the image of the Virgin and Child in its apse. An inscription, now partially destroyed, accompanied this image, which read, the images which the impostors had cast down here pious emperors have again set up. The consequences of iconoclasm extended beyond the realm of Byzantine art. It had broader political implications, notably the estrangement of the Roman Church, which rejected iconoclasm. This conflict strained relations between the papacy and the Byzantine emperor, as well as the iconoclast patriarchs of Constantinople. Constantine V transferred ecclesiastical jurisdiction over the Balkans from the Roman Church to the Patriarchate of Constantinople, marking the point at which Rome lost its religious influence over the Balkans, except for its west coast. Additionally, this period witnessed the Pope's willingness to seek political alliance and protection from the Frankish lords in the west. Charlemagne in particular secured the Pope's favor by defeating the Lombards, an accomplishment the Byzantines had failed to achieve. As a result, Charlemagne was crowned the Emperor of Rome in the St. Peter's Basilica. 
in 800. The damage caused to the relationship between Rome and Constantinople by iconoclasm played a significant role in ushering in a new era in Western Europe under the rule of the Carolingian Empire. In summary, the iconoclastic controversy had far-reaching consequences, not only in the realm of art and theology, but also in the geopolitical landscape of the time, contributing to the evolution.